I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. No one is better qualified to talk about women, power, and politics than Gloria Felt. She's the former head of Planned Parenthood and an author. But most importantly, she's an activist with boundless energy who exhorts us to political action. And if you can believe it, she's also a grandmother. Thank you and welcome. Thank you, Ronnie. I'm delighted to be here, and I do I love exhorting. Oh, good. Too. It's such a great <laughs> yeah, word. It's a wonderful it? just, word. Yes. Yeah. But you're you're a great grandmother, and I've you know your story, your own personal story, is so compelling and so interesting and so intertwined with what you've done in your life. So can we just tell a little bit about your story? Sure. You were born in Texas. I was born in Texas in a town called Temple. Oh, good. <laughs> and it was, uh, I think my life is an example of why the personal is political yeah. and the political is personal. Right. Because, so I was a, an adolescent during the 1950s when girls were not exhorted yeah. <laughs> to do much of anything with our lives except get we married, should yeah. get married early, have lots of children, and that was life. And that and was we never it. thought and, about what would happen and afterwards. And cook and clean and, yeah. and, and take care of other people. And it's not that there's anything wrong with that, as Jerry Seinfeld would say, but there are other things in life, too. I only discovered that later, and I'll tell you how. <laughs> uh, and that's really the story of how I became involved with, with reproductive health and rights. I, uh, I then moved to a, an even smaller town called Stamford, which is near Abilene. That would be. But the, you got married. Was, I got married. I you did. Got pregnant. I got pregnant. I got married. I were was you? fifteen. Oh. I got married. And that's what you did. Yeah. And I uh, moved then to Odessa, Texas, in the oil patch in George Bush country. So that gives you a little yeah. idea of sort of the politics that I grew yeah. up in. And I quickly had three children in succession. So here I, I am, twenty years old. Oh. I had three children. And I love them dearly. They, they have been the center of my life, the center of my universe. But I was exhausted, I was mm. just exhausted. And lo and behold. And lonely, you must have been lonely. It was were quite you? lonely. I, I was mean, even you like younger it. than, even though people were getting married at a very early age yeah. then, I was still younger than others. And, and also, I, I had been a pretty smart kid. Mm. And I had always been encouraged to use my brains by my family. And uh, there wasn't much encouragement for that at all in the general culture. Mm. And so I was kind of a fish out of water in a way. Now, so in 1962, my gynecologist said, you know, there's this new birth control pill. Maybe you'd like to consider taking that. Uh -huh. I will tell you, <laughs> it changed my life. And I really believe the birth control pill saved my life because it gave me an opportunity, first of all, as an exhausted mother of, of three babies, to, to rest a little bit, to rest my body, to begin to think about other things I might do in life as well. And when my youngest child was four months old, I enrolled in the community college. Boy. I wouldn't have been able to do that if I hadn't have been able to see now with the pill, I can actually have reliable birth control so I can plan ahead. So you planned. So I planned. And I started a college. It took 12 years to finish. During the course of that, I got involved in civil rights organizations in my community. Believe it or not, they even existed in Odessa, <laughs> Texas. And uh, I, I would have probably gone off marching in Selma had it not been for the fact that I had the three children. So I looked for organizations and things I could do in my local community. Turned out that Head Start was just beginning, and I, I yeah. became a first a volunteer, and then they offered me a job. While I was at Head Start, one of my teaching colleagues, and believe it or not, the Catholic priest where we had our classes in his church, they told me about this fledgling organization called Planned Parenthood. And the priest said to me, you know, the people in my parish are poor. How can I tell them they have to have a baby every year? I can't feed their children for them. And I had no idea how radical that was. Isn't that amazing? I, I, yeah. Because I wasn't a cat, you know, I, yeah. I, I had no idea how, how absolutely radical that was. And um, they asked me to do a little volunteer work for Planned Parenthood. I did it. That was it. I went back to, to college uh, the next year to finish my degree uh, after the University of Texas opened a branch in Odessa. And I, while there, I did a paper on this little organization, organization. called Planned Parenthood. 
and, and uh, the so rest, as new, they say, is history. Chapter yes. Started. Yes. What happened to the father of your children? Well, we were married for 18 years, oh, and, and he uh, was young. Also. And he was young. Also, he was 19 uh, when we when yeah. we were married. And, and so, did he have to go out to work right he, away? Absolutely. He had, uh, you know, his college education, which he had begun, was truncated. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's not just the girls yeah, who suffer from the, suffers. from the results yeah. of teen pregnancy. It's, it's also the boys. Right. And even though they may tend to be a little bit older, uh, they, they have it's, it's, very, it's hard. very hard, very hard for yeah. them. And so, the responsibility and yes, everything else. It's yes. just a whole kind of thing. So you started with Planned Parenthood in, in western Texas and yes. then you landed up over the whole country. Yes. And it was during a very contentious time. Yes. It's still a contentious. Yes. It is. It will always be contentious. Yes. Where, where you, were you working for them at the time of some of the major um, court decisions? Well, interestingly enough, no. I entered the movement in 1974. Uh. So by that time, in, we had had Roe v. Wade, which was decided in 1973. That decision legalized abortion. Right. Based on the 1965 decision, yeah. Griswold versus Connecticut, tell, that had legalized birth control. And that's so shocking, right? Yes. That, yes. that birth control was, I remember, because I told you my father worked for Planned Parenthood in the 50s, yes. and you couldn't buy contraceptives in Connecticut. Correct. And, uh, the whole thing. So, anyway. so you've seen enormous change. I have seen enormous change. Enormous change. Now, the the, the problem was, you know, I, I often say that that movements can suffer the wages of winning, mm -hmm. and that's what happened, because by 1974, when I became involved, everyone who had been involved previously thought we've won. Yeah, done. Roe Ro v. Wade. Yes, yeah, we have won everything. We have federal funding for family planning. We have all kinds of public support. We have the pill. We have the technology. We have all of the laws. We have the policies and the court decisions. We can now go about our business and do something else. Wrong. Wrong. Right. It's never that way. Right. Every movement for social justice has to continue because there will always be new issues and you can never let your grassroots lie fallow. And so I'm telling you right now with the election of President Barack Obama, my worst fear is that we is really that, let it go. Is that, is that reproductive rights advocates and all progressive advocates will again let their grassroots go fallow. We can't let that happen. Uh, but in between, the, the, ex the right mm -hmm. and religious people mounted enormous campaigns that have incredible impact, right? So it's been very worn down, the Roe v. Wade. Yes. Uh, what happened when Roe v. Wade was decided is that it launched a whole new movement against reproductive rights. Now that movement had always been there. We had to have this court case that legalized birth control because in the late 1800s birth control had been outlawed by by, by laws and policies and, and they, they were called the Comstock laws that made birth control illegal. But so that was a 100-year battle it's to get birth control legalized. And, and so, th but people had sort of forgotten that. Mm -hmm. And so th the uh, abortion decision, Roe v. Wade, unleashed a new movement against reproductive rights that had always been there, but it just hadn't found its, its, its organizing point. Well, Roe v. Wade was its organizing point. Now, the public, by and large, was enormously supportive and still is. Mm -hmm. There's been very little change in public opinion. The majority of Americans, overwhelming majority, like two-thirds, say that the decision about whether and when to have a child is a personal and private one, and it shouldn't be the government's business in the first place. And right. so they believe Roe v. Wade should stand. And that was based on privacy. That was based on privacy. Now, here's my belief, and that... But let's, wait a minute, let's okay. get to this in a minute, but let's just explain how they oppose Roe, how they've been able to whittle it down. It's right. basically the state actions and also some, and then brought mm -hmm. to the Supreme Court with other decisions, mm -hmm. right? At first, after Roe v. Wade was decided, the anti-choice groups tried to simply pass laws and uh, constitutional amendments that would outlaw abortion. Yeah. They failed time after time after time after time. And then they got politically smarter. They decided that an incremental strategy, let's chip away bit by bit by bit. Let's do the water on stone technique. Mm -hmm. If we can just nibble away a little bit here, if we can require, say, uh, minors to, to get their parents' permission, 
if we can require women to get their husband's permission. That, that's one they haven't succeeded yeah, on right. yet. If we can just require the state to counsel women to prefer carrying a pregnancy to term instead of instead of having an abortion. If and the, and we can call that informed consent. Yeah. So they have All nibbled away things. and nibbled away and the the latest ruling is called uh, Gonzalez versus Carhart. Now Gonzalez versus, versus Carhart upheld a federal law, the first federal abortion ban that we've ever had. So it's usually it was the states yeah. in the act. Now Congress is in the act and Congress has banned a whole range of, of abortion techniques that often are used by doctors even early in the second trimester of pregnancy. So what they've done is they've made it harder and harder and harder for women to have access to safe legal abortions even though abortion remains legal. 80% of counties, 87% of American counties now have no abortion provider. It's incredible because people aren't even studying it, are they? And I mean, medical schools are not even... Most medical schools don't teach, teach it. it, although there has been a great new movement in, in the last decade or so of That's medical good. students for choice uh -huh. who are taking matters That's into their good. own hands and right. either persuading their medical schools to teach abortion technique right. or they're finding other sources of that training. Right. So you now are saying enough of this privacy. Yes. You want to change the emphasis. Yes, yes. And, and interestingly enough, um, Justice Ruth Ginsburg has been saying this for many years. Mm -hmm. And that is that while privacy is certainly a high value, and it has a lot to say about the limits of government intrusion into our private lives, still, as a value, privacy is never going to trump life. And mm -hmm. so I believe we have to face the issues. Just as you can't be a little bit pregnant, mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't have a policy where, where women's lives are so compromised by, for example, some of the latest attempts of the anti-choice groups have, have been to make the fertilized egg have a higher value in the law than the woman. We have to face that. We have to address that. I think it's time for the women's movements and the reproductive rights movements to just face it and, and to begin to build now a new legal basis based on human rights, women's human rights. Uh, as Hillary Clinton said many years ago in Beijing, women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights. And reproductive rights are a part of that human so rights panoply. So that becomes panoply. a woman's right to control her own body. It becomes a woman's right to control her own body, and that translates then into civil rights laws, mm -hmm. such as the Freedom of Choice Act, mm -hmm. which is, which is uh, has been introduced in Congress, but it not, has not gone anywhere yet. Supposedly, Barack Obama supports that, and hopefully during his it. tenure, it'll start moving. But that law would make it uh, would would keep the government from discriminating against you if you chose to have a child. I've always felt Or if you chose not to have a child. Right. I think it's important to recognize there's two sides the, of the same the point. With, yes. yes mm -hmm. the I've always thought that there was a, a para, there's a relationship between the gay rights movement and the choice movement. And yes. both of them are b about controlling your own destiny, yes. basically. Yes, and exactly. It's an important coalition that yes. should be formed, I think. I, and I think it is a coalition yeah. that, that, I know it is a yeah. coalition that has been formed yeah. uh, and is is very active in in many places. And, and, and any time that there is an anti-gay ballot initiative, you'll find the pro-choice community yeah, helping it. and vice versa. You've, the, the language that's used is so distorted, isn't it? I mean, we're under such... Uh, misconceptions when you watch television or something and they talk about the unborn child, mm -hmm. right? Right. You've, you've cited in your book, and it's a great book and it's a great story because it, it really opens your eyes to mm -hmm. how this erosion has occurred. It's, it's this easy, use of, easy usage of terms. Yes. So tell us some of them. I mean, like, uh, well... Let's the, start with life. Right. Let's start with life. Where does life begin? And, and the issue of, and what is life? What are we talking about? When we, when we say life, and what is the value of a woman's life? Now, to me, when I say the word choice, I'm seeing it in the context of, it, it, that's what makes us human, the ability to choose. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the basis of morality. Mm -hmm. But choice in American society has become corrupted by uh, the fact that everyone uses it now. Mm -hmm. It's used to sell toothpaste. It's used to sell cars. 
So the language of choice is perhaps not as potent as it was. And I think the reproductive rights community has has tried out many different, different terms, different, di many different terms, just as Margaret Sanger in trying to get birth control accepted went from family limitation to birth control to, <laughs> you know, to family planning to, yeah. and now we're, then we went to reproductive health and, yeah. and, and, and it's, the terminology is very important because it shapes how we can think. And so that's another reason why I believe we have to really go back to the basics, women's human rights. Should we talk about women's reproductive rights or women's health rights? I mean, it's mm -hmm. in, in a way we're also contributing to narrowing the definition mm -hmm. by just limiting it to reproductive. I don't know. Um, then the use in the media. Have you found, uh, <laughs> I loved it when you said that you were on a program and uh, you thought you were going to be the guest, and then the the moderator said, "Well, we have to balance your argument." Yes, and th that particular program, I was I was coming on to speak just after a doctor who performed abortions had been murdered in cold blood in his home. So, what was the and, how can you balance? That and there story? is no balance. I, I, yeah, as I said to to this reporter right on camera, what's the other side to murder? There is none. There is none. It's breathtaking how the, how the media, in their quest for what I call false balance, yeah, uh, has 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 polarized has has really been I think a great contributor to the polarization of these issues That's in American discourse. Yeah, they self censor also. They, they self censor so tremendously. Self conscious about yes. their use of things. Yes, and it's a very so that goes now into another thing, which is when you talk about power. Yes. I mean, when you assumed this role of the chief executive officer of Planned Parenthood, both locally and nationally, mm -hmm. you became a chief executive, which <laughs> meant a leader, right? And obviously a successful one if you became the head of the whole thing. Well, what, what, what <laughs> I had to learn over time is that a leader is anybody who gets something done. Right, and who says and, that, and who I, asserts themselves uh, yes. as being a leader. Yeah. Well, you, you just you just get something done, and 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 what I had, I guess, was. But it's more than that. You in, have to get other people to help you get something. You done. do have to. You yeah. ha do have to be able to engage other right. people to help you get something done. Yeah. But first and foremost, you have to be willing to take action. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to movement leadership, it, it, it you can't manage it like you can manage, say, uh, GE or right. uh, some some large corporate entity. You're not really in control of a movement. All you can do is lead. So you have to be able to enable people, engage people in a vision mm -hmm. that's bigger than them. That's what I love about, actually, that's what I love about movement leadership. Right. Yeah. And, and, and that's what's so energizing about it, is that you know you're always working for a mission that's bigger right. and more important than yourself. Exactly, isn't it? And it's a it's a wonderful cover also for people who may be modest. Yes, because that's you, true. Because you can be modest uh -huh. and still very strong. Yes, well see, I believe this is why men go into politics and women start social movements. Yeah, that's true. If you, if you look at, yeah. at the predominantly who's done what, yeah. uh, you know, a man will see an issue and will decide, okay, I'm going to go, yeah. I'm going to go run the country. Right. A woman will look at an issue and say, well, okay, I'm going to gather up all my friends and, and we're, we're going to figure out how to make a change. Right. Yeah. <laughs> now, it's so interesting because feminists worry, or older feminists like, uh, like me, not you, mm -hmm. worry <laughs> that the women's right movement there, has lost its fervor. Right. This, yes. Um, and it's all connected, isn't it? It is. It is so all connected. And every generation has to speak in its own tongue. Mm -hmm. And every generation has to figure out what is it ticked off about. Mm -hmm. What are you ticked off about? Then do something about it. Now, I have had the privilege of being a part of an intergenerational feminist panel. We've been going around to universities and speaking to women's groups and of different, uh, different uh, professional women's groups around the country. And we call ourselves women, girls, ladies, as sort right. of a, a funny way of acknowledging the different terminologies that right. appeal to different generations and the, so and, the, and the fact that we're still talking about what's the right language right. here uh, in, in, in a symbolic way. And we have uh, from age 20-something to me. And yeah, uh, you're they not that old. well, they thought I was a baby boomer, and they invited me because they thought I was a baby boomer. And when I explained I was too old even to be a baby boomer, their eyes got Boy. so big they Is couldn't. Such a they thing? could not imagine anyone could be that old. But sure enough, here so I am. What are the younger issues? So, uh, so the the youngest member of the panel talks about how older women think that younger women feel entitled. 
And she says, but isn't that what you wanted us to do? Isn't that interesting? Didn't you, isn't that what you fought for? So why shouldn't we feel entitled? We've been told we can do anything we want to do and be anything we want to be. What's wrong with that? And she has a point. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, she is a passionate feminist. Mm -hmm. And there are many issues where she sees injustices in the world that she believes are attributable to the fact that women still don't have full equality. And she's willing to work very hard for those. So what we, what we find is that there are many places where we actually didn't realize it, but we share the same concerns. An and that intergenerational conversation is so important. It definitely, it's incredibly important because we just mm -hmm. need to, I, mean, I see it with my daughters and yes. my son. Um, does the, do, do they, are they interested in, when you say she's a feminist, it's mm -hmm. a feminist point of view. Don't you think there is a feminist perspective or a woman's perspective that differs from a male perspective about life? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question and, and, and it's one that's a little bit hard to, to answer yes or no. Uh, I, I, I think Generally speaking, the answer is yes, because how you look at anything is going to depend on the lens through which you look at it. And I think that we can see uh, that a woman's lens is different from a man's lens, at least still at this point in our, in our history. Uh, I, I did a, a, a post on, on my blog, uh, Heartfelt Politics, the other day after, after Davos, and I was looking at those mm -hmm. pictures where it was, it was all... all Men, white. all white men sitting around the table. Okay, they're talking about how the world is in a mess. Yeah. Well, guess what? Who <laughs> created that mess? So the men are going to see that differently. Yeah. It's, it's a good time, I think. It's exactly the right time. It's the moment for women to, to be more a part of the leadership. And we seem to be. And we seem to, to be. To be coming yes. that. Yes. But, but isn't that the basis of all the reproductive rights uh, conflicts over the generations yes. and ages yes. is to if, keep the women in their place. Right? There's a good reason why the words barefoot and pregnant got linked and why that used to be a joke. Mm. And it's just uh, not a joke anymore. We now understand it's not a joke because reproductive freedom, the ability to determine for yourself whether and when you will become a mother, is the first thing that a woman has to have in order to achieve anything else in her life. But the second thing she needs to have is the ability to be economically self-sufficient and productive mm -hmm. and to use her, her skills to achieve that economic independence. And that changes the power balance in gender relationships. Those people who are afraid we're trying to change the world, I have to confess, they're right. <laughs> <laughs> we are changing it. In, in my view, I think in our view, for the better. And I think ultimately it'll be for the better for men too. Oh, I was gonna say, definitely for the be betterment. I mean, it, yes. it has to be, it, it equalizes everybody's responsibilities exactly. and worries. Exactly, and as you, as you mentioned earlier when you talked about my, my ex-husband, yeah. uh, the responsibility felt totally, on, hi felt totally mm -hmm. on him to earn the money to support mm -hmm. this little family. Yeah. Whereas if I had been able to go to work at that time, we would have been able to share that burden. Right. And uh, those were the days of help wanted female. <laughs> That's right, when the separate columns. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. I was thinking also, um, we could in New York, we could check the box that we don't want to serve on a jury because we're women. Oh, is that right? Isn't that incredible? <laughs> um, when you go to Congress and you see all of these restrictive uh, bills being introduced, how often are, there, are they supported by women? Is there a difference? There is a difference, and one of my favorite stories is actually a, about when we, want, when we started working to get birth control covered by insurance. Mm. And this was about in 1997, I guess, when we started working on this. And in, we had bipartisan support from the beginning. We had uh, actually Olympia Snow, mm -hmm. pro-choice Republican, and, and Harry Reid, anti-choice Democrat, were, <laughs> were, were, were the co-sponsors initially. And they, uh, what happened was that even the more conservative women, by and large, could rally around the idea yeah. of birth control. Yeah. And so when Nita Lowy, brilliant strategist that she is, attached an amendment to the federal uh, appropriations bill requiring the federal employee insurance to cover contraception yeah. if it covered other prescription drugs, which right. it does, and it's the model for insurance across yeah. the country. Uh, what uh, there was opposition to it, to be sure, but 
ev almost every woman in the House of Representatives got together, stood out on the steps of the Capitol for one of the most amazing photo ops I have ever seen, like a sea of skirts, some colorful right, jackets right. and skirts, <laughs> to support women's ability to get birth control. So it is an example of how a woman's lens mm -hmm. does change mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. They may not altogether agree on abortion, but I think it'll be a lot easier the more women there are in Congress to get folks together around a proactive prevention agenda. Mm -hmm. And that ought to be something we could all agree on. So you are, we've come to the end of this half hour, which is incredible. Uh, you are both uh, the greatest strategist, right, <laughs> and inspiring, and, and a proponent of leadership. But leadership also depends on confidence, doesn't it? And we want women to be confident. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Someone once asked me what, what was the most important ingredient uh, as they were trying to replace me in West Texas, I think yeah. it was. And I just blurted out raw courage. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's it. And, and it, the doors are now open for women. Yeah. But S women have to walk through them. All right. And assume that responsibility. Walk yourself through it. And you know what? Reach back and bring, bring another, another woman, woman with you. Thank you so much, Gloria. Thank you, Phil. Ronnie. It's a Thank pleasure. You. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.